This week on Lewis on the Law, I have another awesome show for you. I have attorney Esther Graff Radford on, and we're going to talk about asylum law. Welcome to Lewis on the Law. You are listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I have yet another awesome show for you today. I have attorney Esther Graff Rafford on with me, and we are going to talk asylum law. Esther, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your law firm? Absolutely. It's my passion in my firm. I do asylum law. I do civil litigation, some employment work, some landlord-tenant work. But what I really what I really love, what's really close to my heart, is pro bono asylum work through the Immigration Justice Campaign. Asylum works. What does that exactly mean? So asylum work is the work of representing refugees in, in immigration court in front of immigration judges. Okay, so just refugees and that's just asylum law? Refugees are the people under U.S. law who are able to get shelter under our asylum treaties and laws. Yeah, so refugees are people who are outside of their country of origin, and they've been persecuted, and they've been persecuted for very specific reasons because of their race, their nationality, their religion, membership in a particular social group, which is a quirky little category unique to asylum law, um, and political opinion. Now. When you think of refugees, you really don't think of the United States. I mean, I always think of like uh, Europe or Middle Eastern countries or Africa where, you know, people are escaping, uh, you know, hostile hostilities, a war, famine, whatever. Is that really common in the United States? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's common. And in fact, you know, if you've been not in a coma or under a rock for the last few months, <laughs> you probably know that asylum law is a hot topic. You know, all of a sudden this 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 corner of immigration law has become really sexy, really controversial. Um, but it's every every single asylum case is a human story. Sometimes it's the story of a whole family, a whole community. Now, the asi- the people who are seeking asylum here in the United States, where do most of them come from? So right now, the thing that you're hearing the most about is people coming up from Central and South America. Um, mm. And I am not, I don't pretend to be an expert on the big geopolitical forces that are pushing people towards our borders. But those are definitely the bigger waves of folks. My current client, though, people are coming from all over the world, though. Anyone who has been persecuted in their home country um, on the basis of one of those protected grounds is eligible to seek asylum here in the U.S. So I've got a client right now who is a teenager from West Africa. Mm-hmm. Okay, so to seek asylum, what does that mean? Does a, does a refugee just go and say to your nearest police officer, I need asylum? Is, is that how, uh, is that how you it know, happens? You know, I mean... Not exactly, no. Okay. But so our our law, and, and it's really important to know, this is a really important thing that I'm screaming at the TV a lot these days because a lot of folks are out there giving loud speeches and getting it completely wrong. Asylum seekers Wait a minute, are, are you saying politicians are getting it completely wrong? That that can't be true. I'm gonna no, I'm gonna mind. need you to just steady yourself for okay. a moment, take yeah. breaths, sip some sweet tea, but uh yeah, I've gotta I tell believe you that, everything my local politician tells me. Oh, honey. <laughs> and if you believe that, I have a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you as a tenancy in common. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, controversy right now being stoked around asylum seekers. And what's really important to remember is that asylum seekers are following our law. Seeking mm. asylum <clears throat> is legal. And when you talk about people coming here the right way, seeking asylum is one of the right ways for people to come into this country really important that people know that and that people um, differentiate asylum seekers from people who are just sort of here in a general way. Although asylum seekers can be undocumented people who entered without um, presenting themselves to the authorities. Okay, so if you're saying uh, enter this country in the right way, are you saying that they come across to Ellis Island or some uh, southern border checkpoint and say, I'm here to seek asylum. Is that what you're talking about? Sometimes, yeah. So what our law says is that you can apply for asylum at a port of entry or if you've been present in the country for less than a year, unless there are exceptional circumstances. And that's a pretty high bar to meet. So generally speaking, and what's been in the news a lot these days is people who are coming to a port of entry, you know, the big the big checkpoints where cars come through and they talk to everybody, and they're they're literally walking up and saying, I'm here to seek asylum. Now, I have never physically been to one of those ports of entry. I'm not going to present myself as an expert on what happens there day to day. But those people get, get a credible fear interview, and they sit down with a trained agent who assesses whether or not they might be eligible for asylum. So 
you can be an undocumented immigrant and still uh, seek asylum? Absolutely. And up until one year in the country. Now, asylum's not open to everybody. You have to meet those criteria. Mm-hmm. And you can't be someone who tortured people back home and then came here. And like, oh, God, the yeah. people I tortured have gotten free and now they're about <laughs> yeah, to cut me into exactly, little pieces. Exactly, exactly. You can't be trying to run from your own crimes. You can't have committed a crime of what we call moral turpitude which is a beautifully Victorian way of saying a really, really serious crime that we really, really don't want you coming here to commit more of. (laughs) Amen. No more criminals. So how does an attorney help in this? I mean, how how can an attorney help? So a really important thing to know is that there are about 400,000 people in immigration detention every year in the United States. A lot of these immigration detention facilities are for profit. And so, especially here in Georgia. And so there is kind of a nasty incentive to detain people for long periods of time. Um, When someone has an attorney in their immigration case, their chances of getting relief from removal 10 times an increase with a lawyer. The problem is that only 14% of detained immigrants are getting an attorney. Because there aren't any attorneys, there's not enough money in it? There aren't enough attorneys. It's And, yeah, a lot of these folks, when you think about someone who's a refugee, you don't think of someone carrying bags of cash across <laughs> borders. I mean, people, and if they do, they're just a little suspect. Yeah, huh? the, hard, the hard truth is that if you really are someone who really is a refugee, mm-hmm. you probably expended most of your resources, financial and social, getting out mm-hmm. and getting to safety. So when you get here... You don't have tens of thousands of dollars to hand an attorney. Well, so, why would we want to let people in who have no money? Well, Is I this think the right thing to do? Because it honors our international treaty obligations. Okay. okay. And because it honors our domestic law. Okay. We have an obligation. And these, these international treaties started to be promulgated after World War II. We saw what a world without a system for safely dealing with refugees we saw what that world looks like and we all decided to fix it and we've passed laws that honor our obligations under those international treaties so when we say that someone is a refugee that's something that's recognized in international law that's an international law definition that's not something that congress just came up with out of the blue Okay, so what made you want to practice in this area of law? It sounds like it's, I mean, I went into real estate law because I thought I was going to make a lot of money. Little little did I know I'm (laughs) scraping just like the rest of us. So, you know, I did not take immigration law classes in law school. Frankly, it's not something that I was really focused on. I have had a love of learning languages and a love of speaking French for a really long time. Um, but a couple of years ago, a dear friend of mine who's on the board of El Refugio down in Lumpkin, wait, wait, Georgia. Wait, El, Re- what is El the- Refugio uh-huh. is a nonprofit that serves the families of detainees at Stewart Detention Center down okay. in Lumpkin, Georgia. Okay. Um, El Refugio works closely with a community of immigration attorneys and with the Southern Poverty Law Center staff that's down there in Lumpkin. And my friend kept telling me, come down and visit, come down and visit, come down and visit. And I kept saying later, later, later. So finally, one weekend, I hopped in my RV and I went down there and I actually spent a day or two in the detention center. Mm -hmm. And it changed my life. Okay, okay. I'm biting. What what was it that changed your life? What what did you see? What did you hear, feel? So I think when most of us hear immigration detention facilities, we think something on the lines of like grown-up summer camp, not as much fun. Like I think we picture people living a fairly well-provided-for life in a holding pattern, Mm -hmm. you know, while they wait. Um, These facilities in Georgia are medium security prisons. Mm -hmm. Now, it's important to remember that the people being held in them are not people who are serving time for a crime. Mm -hmm. If you present yourself for asylum in the U.S., you are following the law. And so we're detaining people in medium security prisons. They can only see their family for one hour, one time a week. They have to touch their children's hands across panes of glass. So I sat there and I watched families waiting all day for the chance to see their loved one through a pane of glass on a scratchy prison telephone line. And I talked to some detainees and I walked out of there and I thought, you know, this isn't working. What can I do? There's a lot of human suffering happening here. 
And I realized that the best, the highest and best use of my time was to represent people in their immigration cases. Everything has to be filed with the court in English. It's a fairly complex area of law. Um, and I just, there's a reason why when people have an attorney, their chances of success go up by a, a factor of 10. I you need a, lot, a lawyer. Yeah, I do a lot of pro bono work and I definitely see that effect. Okay, we're at the end of the segment. That was a really good segue. I've got some more questions on that I want to get into in this next segment. Why don't you give you give them some contact information for you? Absolutely. If you're an attorney, a translator, a social worker, a doctor, and you want to get involved providing pro bono services to immigrants, you can take a look at immigrantjustice.us. Immigrantjustice.us. Or you can go to SPL Center. Dot org. That's the Southern Poverty Law Center's website. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I am your host this week and every week. All my old shows are archived on my website, so if you have a topic that you want to hear about, just go to jameslewislegal.com, and you can check out all my old shows. We are also national. We are on every single national live streaming service or streaming service. It doesn't have to be live. iTunes, Google, or even AI compatible. Just say, Alexa, play Lewis on the Law. You are listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I'm your host this week and every week. And we have an, an, a fascinating show uh, going for you right now. But first, I have to tell you guys, if this show is designed only to empower you, the listener, with legal information, if you have a very serious legal issue, you need to go ahead and contract with an attorney. Don't take the advice you hear on this show as legal advice. It is only legal information. If you need to find an attorney, you can always contact me at jameslewislegal.com or email me at james at jameslewislegal.com or you can give me a call at 404-610-0075. And I can help you find an attorney. A lot of attorneys come through this show, so I can direct you towards one. You can go to my shows, and I, most of the attorneys give themselves contact information, so you can just go ahead and contact them directly. But whatever you do, if you have a serious legal issue, do not rely on what you hear on this radio program. This radio program is only designed to give you legal information to help you decide the issues at hand, what types of things are going on, if you actually have a case, or what type of attorney you might be looking for. When we left off, Esther, you were telling a fascinating story about an immigration or immigrant detention facility. Is that correct? Yeah, so my introduction to asylum law and to the needs of asylum seekers was down in Lumpkin, Georgia, in Stewart County, at the Stewart Detention Center. Um, it's a very small town. I think the population is under 2,000. Um, it's a very it's a very uh, low income area. A hundred percent of the students down there in Lumpkin qualify for free or reduced lunch at school. So it's an area that needs the jobs of the detention facility. But these facilities are for profit. Um, there's a group based here in Atlanta called Project South that has gone in and done surveys of the for profit detention facilities in Georgia. And one of the things that they found, particularly at Stewart, was that inmates are being they say it's a voluntary work program, but they're paying um, people in civil detention. Remember, that's important. They have mm -hmm. not been convicted of a crime. They're not serving time as punishment for a crime. Mm -hmm. They're paying people in civil detention one to four dollars a day. Now, we're talking a 12 hour shift. Wow. To do the jobs that they would otherwise have to pay low income people in that area who need work mm -hmm. to do. So it's basically kind of state-supported so slavery. It's kind of nasty when you put it next to the 13th Amendment. Um, so Project South and some other groups have brought a lawsuit against that detention facility, a class action suit on behalf of detainees challenging some of those forced work programs. Now, when I say forced work programs, what I mean is that the facilities are not providing the detainees with adequate amounts of basic living necessities, um, soap, food, that kind of thing. And then they're telling the detainees, you know, phone cards so that they can contact their loved ones who may have to come from far, far away, a whole different part of the country. Um, they're selling expensive phone cards in the commissary, and that's some of the only ways that these people can keep in touch with their families. So imagine that you're told that you can't speak to your wife unless you work a 12-hour shift for $1 to $4 a day, and then you can pay that money back 
to the for-profit prison corporation for a phone card or for toothpaste or for soap. Wow. And then if you're, you're told, and what we found is that, and what the lawsuit alleges is that when detainees say no, no thank you, I, I, I will not, sometimes they're put in solitary confinement. Wow, that's horrible. For that. So it's not voluntary. Conditions are very difficult in these facilities. People need to understand that, and they need to understand that companies are making a profit off of these difficult conditions. That's that's pretty heavy. Now, when you say civil detainees, and it sounds like inmates, but with inmates, you have a sentence, and there's a period of time in which you're going to get out. Is that the same? Is that the same? Is that the same situation? Do they come in here seeking asylum? They're detained for a while civilly, and you know, there's a six month period, and then they are free, and that you know, uh, no, that you know, is not how it works. Pa- they will get a little American package, a pair of Levi's jeans, a pack of Marlboro <laughs> cigarettes, a case, a case of Budweiser, and get. They're not the door and said, go be an American. I mean, I think that's our that's our national mythology, right? <laughs> I think that's our that's our best vision of ourselves is that we're just and welcoming. Well, it'd be the best vision if they like also got a Harley Davidson. <laughs> it'd be the best vision if they also got a Harley Davidson motorcycle to uh, to roar out the roar out the gates with. But Forty I mean, acres, a mule, much. and a Harley. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. What we're going right. For, is that's that's, a all, new that's all you need. <laughs> James Lewis has a new vision for America, folks. Yeah. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm for it. No, just to give you an example, and I don't pretend to be an expert on on what's happening across the system. There are people that you could bring on your show who have been doggedly and dedicatedly doing this work for decades. And mm-hmm. I don't pretend to. Um, those are my mentors. Those are the people who I admire and look up to. I'm passionate about doing this work because they were willing to teach me very quickly how to do it. I was able to get up to speed on asylum law and I was able to take a client very quickly and start helping people. And it's literally life or death. There are very few. Wait a minute. Do people die in these civil detention centers? Uh, Yeah, sadly, actually they do. Um, The cases that I know about are in Stewart. There have Mm -hmm. been several deaths in Stewart detention center since I've been paying attention over the last couple of years. I have friends who know these people personally. Um, And it's, it's, largely due to the fact that conditions there are so bad that suicide is a real danger and the fact that there's not adequate metal or medical or mental health care in these facilities. So you'll have people who clearly are presenting serious mental health needs. You'll have families who are lobbying the facility, asking the volunteers. You'll have nonprofits like El Refugio that are stridently begging for services for a person and then the person... It, it has happened that a person has died more than one, more than one, more okay. than one. OK, so when w- earlier on in this program, you said a definition of refugees. Where is that definition coming from? So that definition of refugees is coming from the international treaties, the U.N. Convention on Refugees and the Protocol on Refugees. And then it's been incorporated into U.S. law as part of the Immigration and Naturalization Acts. And basically what that says is. A refugee, the attorney general has discretion to Mm -hmm. grant asylum or relief from removal to a refugee. Well, what's a refugee? A refugee is someone who's outside of their country Mm -hmm. because they've been persecuted Mm -hmm. because of race, religion, nationality, particular social group membership, or political opinion. Now, persecution, it's real important to know, persecution, crazy high bar to meet. Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, because, I, you know, I think that I'm persecuted because I go into an office and I'm a <laughs> Dallas Cowboys fan and, it, and I'm surrounded by nothing but Eagles fans. And I feel like I'm persecuted every day. They're like, look at that ugly Cowboys mug. And so is that persecution? Am I persecuted? No, nah, brother. <laughs> no. Nah, in, uh, in immigration law parlance, we would say you have suffered mere harassment. <laughs> oh, I have harassment. Well, that's something. Mere harassment. Uh-huh. And not on the basis of a protected ground. No, (laughs) persecution. And another important thing to know is that these cases, the appellate process is up to the Board of Immigration Appeals. So you, you, you have a merits hearing before an immigration judge. You can appeal to the Board of Immigration Appeals in Virginia. And then the circuit court of the circuit where your immigration judge sits, hears the case. So when I say 11th Circuit Law, I'm talking about cases that have made their way up through the administrative appeal process and to the 11th Circuit. Um, The bar for persecution, persecution is an extreme concept, Mm -hmm. is the the legal principle we're working with. So we're not talking um, a little old death threat with no teeth behind it. Okay. We're talking um, 
serious threats from people who can actually carry them out. We're talking attempted murder. We're talking serious physical harm. Um, we're talking if you would have to fundamentally change something core to yourself to avoid being killed or seriously harmed. It's a serious, serious bar. These are not people who come here and get asylum are not people who were being pantsed in their local junior high. We're not talking <laughs> we're being, about we're, bullying. We're being pantsed in the, what, what, Okay, what is wedgies, pants? Wedgies. Oh, okay. Oh, that's, that's so good that you don't know that. Yeah, I was never pantsed. <laughs> you but, had a healthier junior high experience. Than I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh no! <laughs> but we're talking. We're talking about serious, serious, serious harm here. Our law has a pretty high bar for that. You do not come and seek asylum successfully because you didn't like your job. Or because someone uh, stole your car, or because you had a vague notion that the ruling political party might disapprove of you. You have to prove that you have suffered really serious things, or that you have a reasonable, a subjectively and objectively reasonable fear that you will suffer very serious harm if you're returned to your country of origin. Okay, so um, I guess it's the attorney general who makes this decision? So the attorney general is the ultimate discretionary authority in the administrative process. Another funky thing about asylum cases is that the judge and the prosecutor work for the same guy. Oh, okay. Um, immigration courts right now are not Article One courts. Mm -hmm. And that's something that the American Immigration Lawyers Association is lobbying to change. But they're not. Um, immigration judges are administrative law judges who work for um, yeah. the attorney general. Mm -hmm. They work for the DOJ. So the attorney general actually is the final authority. Now, usually that's done through the immigration judges mm -hmm. and the Board of Immigration Appeals, but every once in a while, the attorney general can certify a case specifically to himself. Okay, this sounds like you're getting interesting. We're at the end of this segment, so one more time, give some people some contact information for this. So if you're an attorney or a translator or a social worker or a doctor or anyone who thinks that your services could be useful in pro bono asylum cases. And that's pretty much anybody who, <laughs> who breathes, right? <laughs> anybody who breathes can show up and see what you can do. Um, you can go to immigrantjustice.us or you can go to the Southern Poverty Law Center's website at splcenter.org. They have a program called the Southeastern Immigrant Freedom Initiative, and that is the program that I take cases through. But all of these groups are working together and they to provide mentorship, resources, and on-the-ground support. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. I have got a great show going for you guys today. If you have an idea or a topic you'd like to hear on this radio program, go ahead and drop me a line at jameslewislegal.com. You can go to my contact page and you can contact me. Let me know your idea in a, in a couple of words or the topic that you'd like to hear. And if I can't speak on your topic, I will find an attorney who actually knows something about your area of law, bring them on, and we'll talk about it on air. When we get back, we're going to talk about some forms for relief on asylum. You are listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I have another great, exciting, and interesting show for you. And this show really is extremely interesting. It's about asylum law. Before we get back into the show, though, I have to let you guys know that I am here, and this show is here to empower you, the listener, with legal information. We want to help you make an informed decision. However, the, the items you hear on this show should not be taken as legal advice. We are not giving you legal advice we may help you find uh, the information you need to decide if you have a case, whether you might want to employ a certain type of lawyer, which would look for in an attorney. But this uh, show is not designed to give you legal advice, only information to empower you, the listener. I have attorney Esther Graf Radford, and we've been talking a lot. And the, the detention thing really, really kind of fascinates me because, you know, when, when, you know, you're arrested for, you know, uh, um, drug dealing, you know, you're in there for a year or, and that's horrible enough, but you know, you're going to get out at some point in time. And I know I've asked this question, but when are, when do these people get out? When, it, when is their sentence over? I mean, is, 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 it seems to me like there's got to be a point in which they get out. Well, you use the word sentence and mm -hmm. this isn't, it's important to remember these people haven't been sentenced for the commission of a crime. They're in civil detention, awaiting determination of their claim for relief. 
So there is no sentence. It can go on for years. Um, it's not unusual at all for someone to stay in a detention facility for more than a year. My client that I've got a client now who's been in a detention facility for um, about a year and a half, and his case still has, if all goes well, his case still has months and months to it. Um, and this is a person who entered the facility just after his 18th birthday um, and will be spending his early adulthood, the time when American kids are, you know, celebrating high school graduation and going off to college. He will be spending that in a detention facility in Folkston, Georgia. Like how long has he been there for? He's been there for about a year and a half. Um and I wish, you know, this this kid is close to my heart. I've kind of gotten really fond of this client. He's a brilliant guy. He's a he's a really motivated young man. He came into the detention facility. Basically, part of his claim is that he had been deprived of an academic education. He came in basically functionally illiterate, um, not speaking. He spoke four languages when he came in. He did not speak English or Spanish. Um, and he didn't read the Latin alphabet. And in the detention facility, this is how motivated this kid is to succeed in life. He has taught himself fluent Spanish. He has taught himself the Latin alphabet. And he has taught himself to read novels in Spanish. He's reading Isabel Allende novels in Spanish. And we're talking about them when we have our legal calls. He's motivated me to start trying to learn to read novels in Spanish so that I can talk about them with him. And I know what's going on. Um, so this is a this is a really, really capable and brilliant guy. And I can't help but wonder how many other just absolutely golden people like that that we kind of want to put a jersey on and put on the team are are wasting away right now in these detention facilities. OK, that's really interesting that you're talking. Do you mind talking a little bit about this client a little bit more in detail? Like, I, th I think it's a really good way to take a look at, at the issue by looking at specific, like, case studies. I think that really helps. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is an ongoing case, so I'm not going to get too much into the details mm -hmm. of his claim. Um, but I will say that he is a he is a West African um, client, a young man, who had to flee absolutely devastating and life-threatening persecution on several bases in West Africa. Um, he speaks his local tribal language, and he also speaks fluent French, which is the which is the governmental and official language of the area that he's from. And so that's how he and I communicate. We communicate in French about novels in Spanish mm -hmm. and legal work and documents in Fulani and Spanish and English. Um, so if you're someone who loves languages, it's kind of a rich multilingual practice. Um but his claim, he suffered extreme, extreme and severe persecution for most of his life that culminated in a near-death um, beating, an attempted murder. When was this he persecution was at the hands of, of the government? This was persecution at the hands of a private actor. So asylum claims don't have to be based on a government official okay. doing something to you. Mm -hmm. um, this is an oversimplification, but in general, it has to be persecution by someone that the government is unwilling or unable to control. And that can't mean just um, the police are really bad at catching this, these folks, mm -hmm. but they're trying. Mm -hmm. It has to mean that the government actually throws its hands up and acquiesces or that it's kind of a wink, wink, nod, nod. Oh, yeah. Uh, don't do that to people of that religion. We'll be over here plugging our ears and singing in the corner. You know, the government, you have to show that if it was a private actor that persecuted you, that the government just wasn't going to protect you. That's a lot. OK, so uh, he's been in there for a year and a half. He's he's had a near death experience. What are his chances of getting out anytime soon? I mean, are, does he stand a chance? Is he just, just going to stay there for the next 10 years? Um, well, I'm his lawyer and I'm going to lay my heart and soul on my appellate brief that I'm writing mm -hmm. for him right now. And I'm going to try to get him out of there and get him asylum. Um, I think it's the right thing to do. He deserves it. He qualifies for it. Um, but, you know, there just there aren't guarantees. There's there's dark humor in the asylum lawyer world that you can show persecution when your client's dead. And that's, well, that's it's a little late then, isn't it? Well, precisely. I mean, it, it, it's some of the some of the. Some of the the cases that come out of 
of the pro bono asylum world are difficult and they're discouraging. And I knew that, you know, in in Georgia, our asylum judges approve, I think the number is 2% of cases. If I'm wrong, it's 4%. I'm not far off. It's Mm -hmm. a very, very small percent of asylum applications that get approved in Georgia. So I knew going into this work that my chances of getting to rent a billboard that says never lost a case Mm -hmm. were slim. I knew that. But I also knew that my humanity compelled me to do what I could do in these cases. And I have to say that for me, the definition of success in these cases isn't that I win every one. Mm -hmm. It's that every client of mine does not walk through this alone. By definition, if someone shows up to seek asylum, they are traumatized. Mm -hmm. And by definition, if someone shows up to seek asylum, they are brave Mm -hmm. and they are resourceful and they are the kind of person who is willing to look into the face of death and destruction, pack themselves and their kids up and start over. And I want to be there to walk alongside that kind of person. I don't want them to look back at this time in their life as something that they did. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine being isolated in a prison where you can't receive incoming phone calls or packages not speaking the language potentially, not understanding the legal system. And it took me a month of late nights and mentor calls to understand the asylum rubric. Can you imagine being a person who just fled trauma, who's trying to teach yourself that law and your life is at stake? And you have to file everything in a language that you probably aren't proficient in? So just you know what terrifies up, me the most out of all of that? I, I'm a person who I feel like I can survive if I know when it's going to be over. Like I'm like, okay, it's going to be a year. I can mark my days and I can suffer through it for a year. What what terrifies me about this this whole thing is when you say there there's no end game or there you you're not sure when the end game takes place, and that 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 must be horrible. I mean, you're you're stuck in this limbo of I don't know. It's horrible. It's horrible. And there are there are asylum seekers with credible and well-merited claims who choose to give up, who choose to go back to what is almost certainly extreme suffering, if not death, because conditions in the detention facilities are so difficult and the uncertainty and the trauma of the process is so difficult. So you said two percent of, of the asylum seekers actually get granted asylum. What criteria is in set? Georgia? In Georgia. So okay. that's not a national number. Okay. Nationally, it's higher. Georgia is, and I, I really don't know the reasons for this, mm-hmm. but Georgia is an outlier in our, um, our immigration courts are outliers in their rates of approval of applications. Okay. So, but is there some sort of criteria that separates the people who are actually granted asylum from the people who are not? Is, or is it just arbitrary? It can't be arbitrary and capricious. That's the way you attack any administrative law, right? It's arbitrary and capricious. Obviously, it does. It can't stand. I don't have the I don't have the um, credentials and experience yet in this work to answer that based on my own personal experience. What I can tell you is that ideally, under the law, there is law mm-hmm. of, um, that is applied to asylum cases. There's a very robust body of of federal regulations, of international law, of appellate court law, and of Supreme Court law. Um, Ideally, and I'm banking my faith and hope as an American in the hope that the immigration courts and the Board of Immigration Appeals do apply those standards and do apply that law. It's not arbitrary and capricious, or it shouldn't be. Yeah, it shouldn't be. Okay, we're at the end of this segment again. Give them some con- give our listeners some contact information again for if they if they feel like there's someone who needs asylum. Absolutely. So if you're interested in this work or someone you know needs representation and can't afford to pay for it, contact the Southeastern Immigrant Freedom Initiative of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and that can be found through clicking through the tabs at splcenter.org. You can also contact the Immigration Justice Campaign at ImmigrantJustice.us. You're listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I'm your host this week and every week. We've got a great show going here. Once again, I'd like to let you guys know that all my shows are archived on my website. You can go to jameslewislegal.com and look up all my shows. I think it's not quite up to date this weekend. I'm going to work on getting everything up to date. 
But you can also listen to my show on every single national streaming medium. You can go to iTunes, Google Play, um, and I don't know all the stream, Spotify, but there's a lot of them. You can go there. You can look for Lewis on the Law, and you'll find my old archive shows. Uh, we are also AI compatible. You can say Google Play, and I have a Google Play at my house, and I did this. You can say Google Play. Uh, hello, Google. Uh, play Lewis on the Law, episode 41 with attorney Esther Raff Bradford in Walla, show will start going. You are listening to Lewis on the Law. My name is James Lewis, and I am your host this week and every week. I have an awesome show going for you. But once again, if you have an idea for a first show that you'd like to hear on my show, um, or if you have a topic that you'd like to hear, go ahead and drop me a line at jameslewislegal.com. And uh, you can go to the last page as a contact page and just give me a short, brief description about your legal issue. And I'll bring an attorney on who'd like to talk about it. You can also give me a call at 404-610-0075. Or you can email me at james at jameslewislegal.com. Now, before we get into the attorney general case, because you were telling me about a case that he actually took on, I, I, I want to know about, and we'll get into that because it sounds really interesting, but I want to know about other forms of relief that might be available to people or might be available to asylum seekers, undocumented immigrants. Absolutely. So there's a kind of trifecta of relief that's available to a lot of asylum seekers. They have slightly different standards, but you file them on the same pleading form and they have a lot of the same elements. Um, so there's asylum, there is withholding of removal, or non refoulement in French in the international law, and there is protection under the Convention Against Torture. Um, and those are slightly different, but you generally, the same evidence usually goes to prove all three, and so you usually plead them together if you qualify for all of them, or if you only qualify for, for one or more of them, then you, you, know, you work with what you've got. Um, but the the generally, if you can't prove asylum, you probably can't prove withholding or we call it cat protection, convention mm -hmm. against torture protection, because those are higher bars. Um, okay. You have to prove to get withholding of removal. What that means is our our laws say in in respect for international treaty law, our laws say, if we think that it's more likely than not that somebody's going to be persecuted when we send them back, we can't send them back to that country. Mm -hmm. We might be able to send them to somewhere else. So it's a little different than can deportation. We do, can we do that? Can we just send them to another country? We're like, you know what? We don't like this guy. We don't like Mexico. Let's just send this guy to Mexico. <laughs> no. Can we do that? No. I mean, not without setting off a diplomatic incident. Okay. I don't think. I think we have to have agreements with the countries. And a lot mm. of times, you know, a lot of people are dual citizens mm -hmm. or triple citizens. Or they are um, people who have been settled in or who have spent time or have connections in various countries and could get permissions. And I'm not, I don't pretend to present myself as an expert on how that works. I haven't done um, that selection process of another country, but I do know that it's a really good option for some folks who are, who are saying, well, I know that I'll be killed if I get dropped off at the airport in country A, but if you sent me to country C, I might have a shot. I might be able to run across the tarmac and actually make it to safety. I mean, it's not, it's not more likely than not that I will be persecuted in country C, and it's almost a certainty in country A, so can we please try country C? Or can I stay here in the U.S.? Okay. Well, that's, that's obviously what this show is about. Can I stay here in the U.S., and how do I go about doing <laughs> Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Okay, so this the attorney general case, okay, we kind of left off. What is that all about? The attorney general took one case himself. Is that is that what you're trying to tell yeah, me? Yeah, so this this actually made it to the mainstream news, this, uh, this odd little particular corner of immigration law became so important in our politics and in our international relations. So, you know, I, I gave that list of protected bases for immigration law, for, for asylum protection. You can't just have been persecuted because somebody wanted the gas station that you owned. Mm -hmm. You have to have been persecuted because of one of those protected bases. And one of those is membership in a particular social group. 
Okay, so a particular social group. What is a particular social group? I'll bite. We just kind of left it there. <laughs> what is a particular social group? Is it, Glad is it, you asked. Okay, is it like the <laughs> frat I, I was in, in in college? No? Um, Oddly enough, yeah, actually. Okay. That okay. probably would fit the definition of a particular social group in okay. international law. So, so a particular social group, it's vague. Mm-hmm. Common sense tells you, oh, that's going to be a doozy to interpret. It's a vague term. And so it had kind of become a catch-all category. And the thing that was bothering some folks and inspiring other folks is that the particular social group category was being used for things like, um, well, my client was a member of the particular social group of women in country X who are being beaten by their husbands and who can't get a divorce. Okay. That's That's obviously in some places a vast category of people. It sounds like that could be a large amount of people, especially in some third world countries, maybe even first world countries. Yeah. And so there got to be a political and I'll give it the credit of saying perhaps a principled legal concern that particular social group was just being interpreted too broadly, that it was becoming a limitation that meant nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so Attorney General Sessions certified a case to himself meaning he himself wrote the opinion and decided the case and because he wanted to clarify some of the law around what particular social group means. Um, And what it means now is that the society that you're in has to recognize you as a group. So your fraternity would Mm -hmm. make sense because if you walk up to your average American person and say, Mm -hmm. hey, can you? What's a fraternity? No, I actually wasn't in a fraternity in college, but that was the first thing I could think of. Uh-huh. You know, it would. It would make sense. That would be something that would make sense. So the, the sort of the sort of um, classic example of a particular social group is a nuclear family. Mm-hmm. So there's case law saying that the, the Board of Immigration Appeals has no trouble recognizing the members of a nuclear family living in a household are the archetypal particular social group. Now, when you get out into vaguer and vaguer things, it has to be an immutable characteristic. It can't be something that you can pick and choose. So, for example, um, taxi drivers working Mm -hmm. in a certain city, that might be something that they might have a professional club. People might recognize that taxi drivers are taxi drivers. But you can stop being a taxi driver any day of the week by turning in your license and going and getting a different job. So that's not a particular social group. But another thing that's really important is that so? So Jeff, wait a so, minute. How does how does that how does that relate to your your uh, example of of every woman who's being beaten by her husband? Uh, how does how is that is how does that relate to that? I mean, then it doesn't seem like that would qualify as a particular social group. I mean, you're just talking about they could run away from their husband and no longer be beaten by them. Right. Well, there's two things. There's there's well, and and don't forget that addendum at the end. Clever, clever lawyers who wrote that one who can't leave. Okay. Right. So uh. it's become sort of immutable if you really are stuck. Mm-hmm. And um, the the interesting thing about that is that matter of AB in my reading says, well, society doesn't go around thinking that. Women who are being beaten by their husbands who can't get divorces are a cognizable group. Mm-hmm. Like if you walked up to someone on the streets of that country and yeah. said, hey, uh, is she over there a member of the social group? Women who are being beaten by their husbands who can't leave. And that's like, exactly what I like, thought. It just seems like it's overly about? broad. Uh-huh. And so particular social groups have to be something that is visible and recognized to the society in question Mm -hmm. things like a family members of a religious organization um, members of members of a group who have suffered certain traumatic criminal activity in the past and cannot Mm -hmm. be um, and that you can't change that factor about yourself Um, it also has to be the reason for the persecution Mm -hmm. so if you're a member of a fraternity but you got beaten up because someone wanted your wallet, mm-hmm. you're not going to be able to seek asylum. You know, it's a silly example, but you're not going to be able to seek asylum under U.S. asylum laws as the member of a particular social group of whatever fraternity mm-hmm. because that's not why they beat you up. They beat mm-hmm. you up to get your wallet. 
But if they're beating you up because you're just a member of this fraternity, they're like, oh, look at that guy. He's got a KA on him. We'll exactly. Just go ahead and, uh, now, if there's a roving gang that the government is unwilling or unable to control that is continually beating you and your friends up because you're a member of, a, of that fraternity, mm-hmm. well, that could be an interesting argument. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a good asylum attorney could work with that. Okay, so that is workable. All right. Yeah, so those bases, but those bases narrowed. Um, The attorney general took very direct and very individual action to narrow that basis for asylum. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's a matter of legal, philosophical, and political uh, controversy whether you agree or not. Are you saying this is a partisan issue? Look how diplomatic I am. Uh You know, it is a partisan issue. I I think it is a partisan issue, but it's important that particular that particular case probably was interpreted in the public eye as through a partisan lens. I don't Mm -hmm. pretend to be an expert on how this stuff persplodes in politics, but I will say and this is important that my mentors who have been working in this space for decades tell me. That immigration law and our asylum system have been difficult and not where they need to be for a very long time, and that it is incumbent upon people who want justice to recognize that that the injustices in the immigration system are not entirely a partisan issue, no. Okay. And that's kind of what I thought. I thought this had gone back uh, through through the generations, and it's, it's something that's been ongoing. From what I can tell, and I don't pretend to be some sort of historical expert on this, both parties definitely bear some responsibility, and this is something that all people from all sides of the spectrum can come together as a matter of human compassion and our vision for what it means to be Americans. Excellent. Okay, real quickly, give them some contact information for you one more time. SBLcenter.org. You're looking for the tab that says SIFI, Southeastern Immigrant Freedom Initiative, or take a look at immigrantjustice.us. That is the immigration activist part of the Immigration Justice Committee of AILA. I'd like to thank attorney Esther Graff Bradford for being here and thank talking you. with me today. And I'd also like to thank the guys that make it happen. Jonathan Bryan over there, the the uh, the savior, the soothsayer of sound, pushing the buttons, making it happen. And we have the visionary of video. See how I change that up this week. Mr. Anthony Cook making all the magic happen. See you guys next week.